Well, hello and good morning. Welcome to Downtown Swiss. My name is Bill, Bill the Butcher. I know you all know who Joe the Plumber is, but uh, Bill the Butcher was around before Joe the Plumber. And I want to welcome you all to Swiss and our meat plant and uh, welcome you and come on inside. Come on in, we're just so glad that you all came today and I'd like to introduce you to our, our business and introduce a little bit of what we do. I'd like to introduce my family, uh, five children and, and uh, grandkids. We've got uh, a whole crew of, of working in the business and uh, I'd like to just show you around, <coughs> explain a little bit about what Swiss meat does and also the history of sausage making in general. And I'd like to introduce you to my daughters. Hi, I'm Dina, Sharon, Vicki, and Janice. We're, We're a family, family business that treats you like family. Okay, now this is some of the things that uh, we had started back in the old Swiss store before we built the processing plant here. Uh, this is very unique because this is the phone that was at the uh, old Swiss store back in the early 1900s, probably up to about 1950. And uh, this was the only means of communication in this whole area. And uh, the Swiss store was a switchboard. And when people called into this area, the switchboard would have to dial a certain number that they wanted to talk to. <coughs> And then that would go either two longs and a short or two shorts and a long and whatever. So it was a party line where people could listen in if they wanted to, but they always had to listen to see if it was their ring or, or not. So up until about 1950, this was still in use. And then on the wall, we got some of the publications and some of the uh, articles that were written, written about us. Uh, at that time, uh, and the top one up here, the first corner, is our original Swiss Meat and Sausage Company building in 1969, up there in the top, and all of these are part of that uh, business. This one here, if you can see, is the old original Swiss store where this was, was used. This was a gas service station next door. And you probably can't see it, but this did gasoline 24.9 a gallon. So that's what it was in 1965. This is my five children right here before they were going to school one morning. Uh, and the, some of this is, like I say, it's about our business after we were already uh, processing here. Uh, this is four different operations that we did start. This was the old uh, service station. When we tore down the gas station, then we built a larger two bay type garage, Conoco, and, and we had that. Uh, this is a building that we had a meat shop in Herman, and this building was built 1870 to 1885, roughly. And this is our Swiss processing plant before we enlarged to what we are today. And then the things that we have well on the wall here is a, is a, a coffee grinder. And this probably was used with coffee and also with black pepper or grinding anything that was in a larger piece into smaller. And it had a, a, a adjusting on it where you could fine grind, coarse grind, or, or whatever. <coughs> of course, it would be caught in a cup. In every farmhouse, in every kitchen, this was a center of all activity. Grandma had all of her supplies, all of her working area. 
uh, the, the flour was in a flour sifter, which would be sifted right into a, a bowl where she'd make her bread or pies or whatever she was baking. Uh, this also had a, a shutter where you could uh, uh, close it all off when she was finished. It also had a dough board, which is where she rolled out her flour and dough to make the pies or the biscuits or whatever and baking the cake. And then, of course, some of the farms might have had an ice box, not a refrigerator, but an ice box. And you had to get frozen chunks of ice brought by the ice man. Now, most people in the city or towns had this, but not so much the farm people. But it would keep milk and butter and cheese and stuff uh, probably for three or four days before the ice melted and you had to get it replenished again. And this is an old wood cast iron cook cooking stove. And uh, it was built probably in around the early 1900s, 1920s maybe, because they kind of enclosed it with porcelain. It's a little bit more modern. But it still had a wood, wood burning fire where the heat would, would heat the metal, and the metal itself would be hot, so it didn't have to stay right above the fire to, to cook. Of course, this is one of the country hams, like the one that we rubbed that showed this morning, uh, making the salt and the, and the, and the uh, curing. Uh, this is something that would have been, and like some of them hanging up here, I don't know if you can see these, but these would be hanging in the smokehouse for months and months until they ate them because they, they would keep, but they had to be cured and smoked so that they had uh, preserved uh, for later use. Of course, this is one of the old meat blocks. We have had many, many of these here, and you can see how it's wore down. <clears throat> these pin holes are in, should, should be in the middle of the block, okay? When it was new, this block was this much taller, and through the years of cutting and scraping and cleaning and wearing down, you can see how much it is off of center. It, was, it used to be that high up to here. This is another one of the old hand stuffers. Now here again are some of the items that the old farmers, the old mom and grandpa had to use. This is a grinder, but it also works as a stuffer. Once you take the chopper blades off, you put a stuffing horn on there, then you can grind it and it'll stuff it out into casings and then it can be bratwurst or, or whatever. This again is another form of preserving. These are sausage balls, uh, uh, pork sausage that, that's just uh, uh, bulk sausage. And grandma would cook them and then put them into a crock like this and then pour grease on them to cover them. And then cover it up, put it back on the shelf until the next morning or next time they use it. Now this would keep probably three, maybe four weeks in, in, in the uh, winter months, uh, but then you could fry this sausage or just enough to warm it up again, and then the grease that was still left over would go back on top and, and seal this again. So the sealing of it was actually caused it to keep it clean and also keep the air off of it so the sausage didn't dry out. And it was a pretty good form of, of uh, preserving. And another thing I'd like to show you, <coughs> this little book here, Little Germany on the Missouri. Now this talks basically about, it's a real good history book about Herman, but also about the entire Gasconade County. And part of it shows the store in Swiss, which is the original store that we started with and we moved in 1965. <clears throat> we did the processing and, and the sausage making here until 1969, and then we started our Swiss meat sausage as where we're at today. But this little book has many, many interesting things in it. And then again, this, sauce, this uh, store building at one time was owned by Fred, or Fritz, they call him, Fritz Gabler. This plate was given out as a, I guess, a Christmas time. Uh, 
but it's got a calendar on it. All 12 months around 19 and 12, and this was also Swiss Missouri Swiss store. So that was given out at this, this building, and this also was F.G. Gabler, the same guy that, that owned the store at that time. So that proves that at least he was here at least 100 years ago. And uh, it was amazing that at that time, every little community had a, had a community store, a uh, general store, and usually a church. And those two things really made the community. It's a place where people can meet and visit. And, and, but it seemed like when the stores closed, the church maybe closed, and, and the community just dissolved. So we've really been fortunate that we still have a church, we still have a meat store, and Swiss is still on the map. Okay, this begins the process of our uh, uh, continuing butchering and our aging area. Uh, we butcher uh, slaughter beef, uh, hogs, lamb, sheep, buffalo, elk, and uh, it, it's all brought in live, basically, of course, and then we butcher and slaughter and as grandma and grandpa did on the farm, they had the butcher in the cool months, winter months, and then do the process and, and everything that we do at home so they had meat for their, for their family. So what we do is take their meat that they've raised, we do the butchering, we do the processing, we do all the manufacturing uh, for them, and that goes back, the whole beef or the whole hog is their meat. So we call it custom processing. And we also do federal inspected, of which we buy the hogs, we buy the beef, and we process it, and we sell it to individuals like you all. And uh, my sides or quarters are, are, are just uh, certain cuts, if you like. Uh, and then also we have state inspection as well as federal inspection. And I think we're the only plant, if I'm not mistaken, in the state of Missouri, maybe even uh, nationwide, that has double uh, inspection just for the fact that the elk and the buffalo and the bison and the emu and stuff comes under state and not federal. So when we butcher those animals, we have to have a, uh, a different inspector here just for those particular items. So otherwise, but we're federal inspected every day. And people, <coughs> people always ask, you mean the inspectors here every day? And I says, yes. And they say, well, aren't most plants or everybody inspected? And I say, no. Their inspector might show up once every six months, but their plant is inspected once every six months. But we have one here uh, 40 hours a week, every week, and we have since 1969. So we've always been federal inspected, and we think that it's the, the best for everybody, and it's just the idea that, that uh, if you butchered something and you didn't know if it was okay or not, well, you've got another authority, a second opinion, to say, even though it's a customs, customer's beef, if it's something wrong with that beef after it's been butchered, they can tell. And I think the customer would want to know, and we would want to know if there's something wrong. It's kind of like an autopsy on a, on a person. You find out afterwards that there was something wrong with this that you didn't know by looking at it. So the idea of inspection is, is worthwhile because it, it ensures people that what they're going to get is, is edible and not something that's just about to kill over anyhow. Uh, years ago, that happened a lot. That it was a farmer that had something that just about wasn't going to make it. He would butcher it and sell it to somebody or whatever he could. So we're, we're proud of the idea that we inspected. Now, right behind me here, this is the cooler. This is our aging cooler where the beef will hang at least 14 to 21 days. And then the hog, the little pig you see here, is a hog that's going to be cooked and smoked whole. It'll be served whole and uh, for a catering job. But we do quite a few of those. And we take it right out to the spot where they're going to be serving it. And it'll be laying on a tray and we'll cut it and slice it right at the uh, at the caterers, and uh, so that's why it looks like it does. We got it tied up. Uh, I 
This is our processing room. Uh, the beef and the hogs, we do start with a live animal, just like they did on the farm years ago. Everybody had their own butchering and the time of year that they had to butcher so that they had meat for the rest of the year and uh, for the whole family. So what we do now, this is a whole uh, side of beef uh, and a whole carcass of pork. And uh, with the different cuts, people always want to know where does I get, how many T-bone steaks I get. And they think a thousand pound beef would have at least 500 pounds of T-bone. No, they don't. The, uh, the uh, hindquarter is your most expensive cuts because that's your, your boneless roast, and your rump, your round, your sirloin steaks. Uh, your porterhouse steaks, your T-bone steaks, and then your ribeye steaks all come off of the backbone. And the reason these are the more tender because they don't use their muscles like the shoulder and like the, the leg. So all of your back center cuts here meat is not really, really tough. So that's your better part of the steaks. Uh, anything that don't go in that steak or roast our ham, what would go into hamburger. You got short ribs, you got neck bones, and here again is your rump roast, your round steak, sirloin, porterhouse, T-bone comes all in this area here. And this beef dressed out almost 300 pounds, and it probably weighed about 1,100 or so on, on foot. Now the whole hog is the same way. We, we do slaughter, start again with the whole live hog. And most butcher shops today, if they, if they talk about a butcher shop, all they do is open a box, take it out, put it in the meat case. It's already cut and wrapped. But most butchers would not know what to do with a whole hog. But being on the farm and uh, had to do this on your own for years, grandma, grandpa, everybody had to help butcher. Uh, so now we take it and take the uh, whole carcass your, your loin, which is your pork chop, again, all of your better cuts and on your, on your backbone, just uh, center, center cut pork chops, your hams, your bacon is on the belly side here, your pork steaks down here uh, off, off your shoulder. Of course, your head, again, as I say, the old timers, they didn't waste anything. The head meat was cooked all in a big pot and all the meat just fell off the bones. It was just completely boneless, the skull and the... So the ears, the snoots, and, and the head meat all got ground up into head cheese, liver sausage, blood sausage maybe. And uh, they might butcher five or six hogs at a time, grandma and grandpa did, and then they would have uh, neighbors or family get together and this would be a whole day or maybe two days of processing where they did the butchering, the cutting, the uh, sausage making, and then they were done for the whole winter. Okay? Now from the uh, cut up part of it, uh, it, it, we go to the saw, of course, cut the steaks and the chops and the roast, uh, and then the boning out, trimming out, and then the grinding, and then the uh, stuffing, which we stuff through an uh, uh, electric horn. Years ago we have, and I'll show you later, uh, a hand grind stuffer where everything pushed out by by cranking. So we'll we'll have a little a little demonstration on that later too. So this is where we started with the old outside smokehouse. Uh, every farm just about had a had a smokehouse, and that's where they had to keep their meat and and keep it clean and keep it from varmints, of course. But as actually it dried and aged and smoked. Now, using hickory wood mainly because, uh, of course, every farm usually had a lot of hickory. Uh, they used a lot of sassafras. They could use other maple woods, uh, but mostly hickory was, was used for smoking. And it did give the sausages, as you can see, a, a brownish bright color, but it also gave it flavor. Uh, smoking does two things. It helps it dry. Uh, but it actually, the, the, the smoke adds flavor as same as the, the spices and the seasoning. Now this smokehouse here, we can put 1,000 to maybe 1,200 pounds of summer sausage at a time. And it takes about three days to 24 hours a day to smoke. 
It's not concentrated, real hot heat. Uh, even in the winter time, with the stove going, it's probably not more than 90, 95 degrees. So it's a cold smoke process, but it takes days and days uh, to do the drying and, and then the, the, uh, the smoking. So after it's smoked, uh, then it goes to a drying process of about four to six, maybe eight weeks, depending on the atmosphere, uh, weather. So it takes a good uh, two to three months at least after you've made this sausage until it's ready to eat. Now, once it's aged and dried like this, it can go all summer long without any refrigeration. And the reason they call it summer sausage, because when Grandpa would make it in the winter time, and we had sausage we would use for Christmas or New Year's or so forth, but he would say, now this is summer sausage, next summer. So it would just become that you don't eat this until next summer. They could take it to the fields, they could take it hunting, they could take it fishing, or just let it hang in a smokehouse and uh, they had meat in the summertime, which normally they wouldn't have. Okay, this is our packaging room uh, where everything is processed, uh, cooked, fresh, sliced, and then packaged before it goes out. What we're doing today, right now, is packaging bacon and joe, and then we will be going to ham later but it's a, it's a process where the machine will package and vacuum and seal it. And then the uh, product goes either in a box to be picked up by the customer or goes to uh, wholesale, depending on, on what product it is. But all the bratwurst, all the uh, sausage that we make, literally goes through this machine. All the hams, all the bacons, all the sausages, uh, summer sausage, deer sausage, whatever we do is uh, vacuum and seal. We have went through the process of the butchering and uh, cutting up and the boning out, making the sausage, stuffing some of the sausage. Now we're going to do the dry rub cure for the bacons and for the hams. Now in order to have a, a, a meat in the winter time keep longer, it had to be cured which is nothing more than a spices, but salt mainly. Salt is what cures. Brown sugar gives flavor, smoking gives it flavor, but salt basically is what has to be cured. Now this is a mixture of salt, spices, brown sugar, and the old time had a, what they call a, uh, a salt box, and it would be a, a large wooden box and they would have maybe 10 or 12 sides of bacon that they butchered uh, so many hogs. The bacons are rubbed all over, all sides are covered, and the ends, because we don't want any uh, exposed where it's not uh, all uniform. And you can't get too much because the meat itself will only absorb so much. It's like a sponge. Once a sponge is full, that's all it's gonna take. So you can rub it as much as you can a lot of it will fall off, which is okay, but it will absorb any and all that it needs. And then it is just put on another box and stacked up. You may have eight or 10 bacons stacked on top of each other. After about a week, these will be completely cured. Then they can be hung, dried, and then smoked. And then after they're smoked, of course, they're ready to slice and, and package. Now the ham the same way, only it's a little different. You got a larger muscle, larger piece of meat, so you really got to put more into it, and especially in the joints. Now here you really have to cram it in there because that has to draw all the way into the bone, around the bone into the shank where the uh, joint is, and that joint is where the meat will get spoiled if it's going to get spoiled. And here again, you want to rub it all, all over. And we do this a lot with the home kill. Uh, a lot of the farmers still butcher their own meat, but they bring us the hams, bacons, and we do the curing, smoking, slicing for them. 
So that is an awfully, uh, awfully good uh, process that people really appreciate. And then they don't have to worry about it spoiling at home. Some people still do it at home completely. But we get an awful lot of fresh ham and fresh bacon like this. And then we do this for them. Now we also teach, oh, about 150 to 175 students, FFA, 4-H students, this same process. Here just, what, two weeks ago? Uh, we had four busloads of students here. And uh, we, we show them and, and have them do this. They, we, we get the process set up and they actually do all this themselves. And then they come back in a couple of weeks, they have to be re-rubbed, re-salted, and then they get hung, aged, dried, and then they hang from four to six months, even up to a year. But what gets cured in January of, of uh, when I was on the farm, that was next Christmas's ham. It took all six to eight, nine months uh, of curing process, and then it was used the following year. So it took about six to eight to nine months to really get a uh, home cured uh, uh, ham. And the aging of it is what makes the flavor. You can't add that aged process. It has to be time aged. Uh, it gets stronger. Uh, smoking, of course, makes it a little stronger also, but it, it's a process that had to be done in order to preserve their meat longer than just for two or three, four or five days of fresh meat. Okay, now this is a sausage. It's already ground seasoned, spices, ready to get stuffed. And this is one of our, one of our original stuffers that we used here 40, 45 years ago when we first started. We didn't have the electric automatic stuffers that we have today. Well, I'm going to crank this a little bit by hand. And this is the horn, what we call a stuffing horn. Okay, this is a natural casing. This is hog pork casings. And we're putting it on the horn. And as we stuff the, uh... now we use this originally when we first started our business here. And we got maybe, a good day would be about 400 pounds of sausage stuffed by hand, but it was this machine, when we got one like this, it was so much bigger than the ones we originally were using and like the people used at home, because this one holds 32 pounds, and most of them only holds about 8 to 10 pounds of pork at a time. So when we making deer sausage, we can make 30 to 35 pounds at a batch, which seemed to us a real good shot of improvement. Okay, I want to cut that there off, and I want to show you just a little demonstration. Now we used to, Grandma would make what we call rope sausage, and we'd put this in the skillet, as is, flipping it all over, all in one piece, and then it was put on a platter, and then when it was served, everybody just cut off what they wanted. That way, all the flavor and the juice stayed in the casings, and that was called rope sausage. Well, then the farmers and the old timers decided, well, why don't we take it, tie it together, put it on a stick, and make 
ropes or ring sausage. And then it could be smoked, and after it was dried and smoked, it would keep in the smoker probably two weeks or longer, a lot more than it would be if it was fresh. Now, besides the rope and the ring, then they also decided, and I think this came more from Germany, but the process of sausage goes way, way, way back, way long, well, they say like 5,000 years before Christ. Even in this country, the native Indians in this country made sausage out of their venison, deer, antelope. So now we got bratwurst. Now people always think that bratwurst is one particular kind of sausage. But brat in German, as I understand it, means link. And wurst is sausage. So it's fry sausage or link sausage. Now when it was in a ring or in the, in the uh, rope, it was not considered bratwurst, although you could fry it, you could bake it, or whatever. But this was usually what considered bratwurst, as uh, the old timers would call it. Okay, we have seen the old smokehouse, which is the original smokehouse that every farmer used to have. And uh, this is our newest smoker. Okay, this is one of the, uh, the uh, brats that we make. We make over 60 variety of bratwurst. And this one we call best of show because we have won four different times at, and uh, the people always came back and they always wanted this sausage that was the best of show. So we just named it the best of show brats. So people now come back time after time after time and uh, ask for that uh, particular. Okay, from here, after they go to the cooler overnight and cool down, and then they will be processed and, and, and vacuum packaged and, and, and ready to sell, wholesale, retail, ship, uh, whatever. So uh, it's just a, a process that the old timers didn't have, so to speak. But we just pick up the way that they used to do it, and we've added a little, little more efficiency to it. But in order to make something fresh when it was fresh, it only keeps two or three days as fresh brats. But when you smoke it and dry it, it could keep two or three weeks longer without freezing. Of course, they didn't freeze it at that time, but they, they had to uh, either dry it and smoke it or fully cook it. Now, this is fully cooked, so it, it would keep uh, weeks longer than it would be if it was just kept in, in the fresh links. So the process of, of processing and preserving, people always think, well, preserving is a bad thing, but preserve, uh, uh, I say we would not function if it wasn't for preservatives, but the natural preservative, not chemical. And we use a process that would, that would be natural and not, not as harmful as some of the chemical processes used uh, to speed up the process, so to speak. Swiss Meat and Sausage Company, a family business that treats you like family.